management of anterior skull base the tumors uh, <clears throat> so uh, the entire skull base has been divided into anterior middle and posterior and the most common lesions that affect the anterior skull base either arise from uh, the so either they arise from the brain side or from the olfactory epithelium in between or from the nasal and the sinus size, size sides so practically this uh, entire uh, lesion, uh, area has uh, tumors which can arise from the intracranial cavity the junction between the nose and the cranium that is the cribriform region and the paranasal sinus or the nasal cavity now uh, generally this has a common symptomatology and uh, all these lesions will pro uh, will have some common rhino nasal complaints and uh, they generally go to a ent specialist and uh, on being a practice to do a plain scan they find some soft tissue reported as polyps and then they undergo a uh, fast and the final report turns out to be malignancy and then they are subjected to radiotherapy so the problem is uh, mainly the evaluation a proper evaluation that needs to be uh, done before the patient receives an inferior quality of the treatment or unplanned treatment and uh, then finally they are subjected to radiation because now the margins cannot be revised nor the tumor or can be uh, uh, resected further so uh, primarily this region of anterior skull base uh, the majority of the load or the tumor is shared by the tumors arising from the sino nasal cavity that means the nasal cavity the sinus is like in order maxillary ethmoids frontal and the sphenoid so these are a distinct group of tumors basically they have uh, though they are very rare or like 3% in entire head and neck cancer but uh, as compared to uh, other head and neck cancers where squamous cell carcinoma predominates this uh, group of tumors they have a wide variety in terms of histology and squamous is just a part of it so <clears throat> around 50% only are squamous rest all other are non squamous cancers so this is a wide histological variety and that makes this class of tumors are very distinct uh, majority of these tumors if we see from uh, uh, arising from ethmoids or maxillary they are kind of infracranial or infra uh, subcranial region and very few of them involve dura and they are generally node negative so how do you kind of do a workup and proper evaluation or proper workup so that you don't end up in unplanned uh, strategy or uh, an unplanned uh, situation on the table so most importantly i think uh, the history part gives you a very much clue about the the uh, the pathology in a way a uh, unilateral nasal mass on a uh, single sided nasal blockage of uh, a recent or a little bit of 3 to 3 or uh, 2 to 3 months of origin uh, primarily important is a unilateral nasal mass uh, so this is a very important history that one needs to be uh, very sure about it or maybe uh, take it very uh, uh, importantly and uh, evaluating this nasal mass of a uh, unilateral nasal blockage like anosmia uh or a history of epistaxis intermittent episodes of epistaxis this all history points towards some <coughs> lesion in the uh, on the nasal side and not only a deviated nasal septum or an allergic or a inflammatory polyp the second most important uh, thing is to do uh, evaluation of the vision if there is any headache vision diplopia uh, like uh, epiphora headaches so these are other symptomatology that needs to be asked uh, you know in a way to consider what could be the pathology that is affecting the patient a detailed nasal endoscopic evaluation uh, will guide for the uh, overall evaluation of the nasal mass when we are doing so so this uh, so whenever you are kind of evaluating so whenever you are trying to evaluate uh, unfortunately this video is not uh, being seen here i was able to play it again earlier so important thing is whenever you do a nasal endoscopy you have to see for the nasal mass the origin of the uh, mass from the meatus from the turbinate from the septum from the roof where it is kind of originating it uh, try to put your uh, endoscope all around and uh, the suction tip uh, to see if that lesion is attached or infiltrating the nasal septum the turbinates or the nasal floor 
and go right up to the stock or to the uh, the origin of this lesion which will give you a clue of the possible etiology or the possible pathology that is uh, this lesion could be and this gives you a fair idea about the uh, the further management or the further workup that you need to plan i'm sorry for the video which is not being played uh, so then important thing is biopsy now biopsy uh, preoperative biopsy gives you a very good impression about how what further management will uh, go because in in this group of tumors the entire treatment plan depends on the histology that the patient is having the histology of the tumor that the patient is having and it has a very important pivotal role in the further management so biopsy uh, uh, of the lesion an adequate representative biopsy is very important in and a routine uh, hematological evaluation of uh, uh, hp or a uh, added super added ihc may be required to rule out uh, any other uh, uh, tumors which are not possible on routine hp so then uh, the, this as i discussed this group of tumors they have a wide variety of histology where you can say squamous cell carcinoma is just a part of it you can have acetaceous neuroblastomas arising from epithelium olfactory epithelium adenoid cystic from the minor salivary gland melanoma mucosal melanomas from the nasal cavity synonasal undifferentiated carcinomas from the neuroectodermal tumor tissues and other tumors like lymphoma sarcomas are also arising from this region and so this gives a wide spectrum of the tumors and the histology is very becomes a very important this is the who classification of the variety of uh, tumors that can happen in this uh, synonasal cavity you can see the uh, the histological variation when you come to the staging so primarily if it is in the nasal cavity maxillary sinus or ethmoid so till the level it is remaining to the confining to its own origin site it is considered as an early stage lesions the moment it starts encroaching to the surrounding structures one sinus going to the other sinus or from one wall going beyond the uh, confines of the walls or entering the orbit or the intracranial component makes the patient an advanced stage uh, disease so so most important uh, thing in management is to evaluate the true extent of the lesion and possible uh, probability of the histological variety or the type of the lesion and how do probably we go further so ct scan mri and pet scan this three imaging modalities uh, are at times complementary complementary to each other for evaluation of synonasal cancers uh, mri precedes other investigation and ct scan is always complementary for the bony evaluation so a contrast mri from skull base to root neck primarily evaluating the morphology and the uh, uh, extent uh, onto the soft tissues of the so intradural extension or a transcranial extension a dural uh, infiltration or a transdural disease are very well seen and picked up on mri ct scan helps to understand the bony limitations or the bony erosions and the bony demarcations of uh, uh, for the surgical planning in terms in con conditions like when there are high grade tumors or more aggressive tumors where the chances of like snucs and snuck where you can have a chance of uh, distant metastasis pet scan may be added to uh, to kind of uh, uh, stage the disease and plan the further management in uh, in nutshell treatment is surgery radiation or chemotherapy by and large all these tumors are uh, primarily uh, surgery means uh, as a major role as except few select group of tumors where uh, chemo radiation or neurogen chemotherapy precedes the definitive therapy so histologically histology determines the treatment and uh, low grade tumors like well differentiated adenocarcinomas intestinal type they are primarily managed by surgery alone in terms of moderate intermediate group of tumors you may add surgery and radiotherapy as an adjuvant therapy but high grade tumors you have to add systemic therapy in in a way or other to manage this tumor so histology is a true determinant of the type of management that you will be planning uh, in general treatment guidelines for anterior skull based tumors and primarily arising from the synonasal cancer so surgery alone maybe for low grade tumor so this is one set of tumor 
or category of tumor where histology determines and defines your treatment guideline so for all low grade tumors like uh, adenocarcinomas low grade adenocarcinomas low grade sarcomas low stage uh, squamous cell carcinomas basal cell carcinoma counter sarcomas they are managed surgery alone but uh, with little bit advanced cases or uh, high grade tumors like esthesian neuroblastomas caddish c or adenocarcinomas uh, adenocystic carcinomas squamous cell carcinomas they are managed with surgery and radiotherapy there are few set of select group of patients uh, uh, histologies where you have to do use induction chemotherapy in the uh, initial treatment and those are high grade sarcomas high grade or high stage squamous cell carcinomas where there are perin invasion like incidence of uh, possibilities of uh, orbital invasion or it is going through transcranially into the uh, into cranial cavity snuck and other neuroectodermal cancers or mucosal melanomas they are the set of tumors where you would like to use nsct induction chemotherapy in the initial phase to uh, have its uh, benefit uh, we'll discuss that in the next slides uh certain group of patients like lymphoma avic sarcoma or most rhabdomyosarcomas so sarcomas and sarcomas and lymphomas are primarily managed by chemo radiation and certain rare multimodal therapy are needed are squamous cell carcinomas adenocystic carcinomas and high grade sarcomas now of surgical options you have open surgical options versus endoscopic or endonasal approaches so uh, open approaches like transcranial approaches where the skull based tumors are primarily involving the cranial side uh, you would do a uh, open surgical approaches where you will have a variety of uh, modification frontal bicoronal uh, bifrontal craniotomy where do craniotomy is bifrontal teronal fronto temporal uh, orbito zygomatic or transbasal craniotomy is wherein the tumors are more on the cranial side you need to uh, open up uh, brain and here the major concerns are the uh, direct uh, problems of the brain retraction and uh, damage to the optic apparatus with a significant blood uh, bone loss transfacial approaches are more for the subcranial disease so when the disease is uh, limited to below the bits uh, or uh, the level of uh, 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 nasocranial separation Uh, those uh, where the you will be doing a uh, transfacial approaches like medial maxillectomies or lateral rhinotomy and approaching medial maxillectomy like this so here the tumors are basically uh, subcranial they are uh, in either involving the maxillary sinus ethmoid sinus or on the palatal sides or infratemporal fossas where you will do a open approach by a transfacial approach Uh, different approaches like lateral rhinotomy weber fusion lynch extension defen back uh, mid facial degloving or with using lefort osteotomy to access to the uh, higher positions the uh, the benefit is it's a direct approach and you can do an n block resection but the problems are it leaves behind a facial scar at the same time the the deeper margins are blind you cannot take a control deeper margin and then you uh, tend to develop uh, positive get positive margins on the deeper aspect certain times when the tumor has a both the components where it is an intracranial as well as intracranial extension you have to combine both these approaches and the that is you know, cranio facial approaches and uh, these are basically where the uh, tumors are extending into the intracranial space paranasal sinus orbits palate maxillary sinus infratemporal fossa so where the extensive tumor with both intra and extra cranial extension you have to combine all this facial transfacial and the uh, transcranial approaches in a uh, uh, combination and a set of patients where majority of the tumors are subcranial you can do an endonasal approach wherein the entire tumor is uh, managed endoscopically and uh, there is a piecemeal uh, removal of this tumor however uh, the major concern in this skull uh, skull based tumor or uh, surgeries are whether an arm block resection is is equally uh, is important or a piecemeal resection is equally effective so various data have evaluated the outcomes of a block as well as piecemeal resection so most important thing is the outcome or the local con regional control doesn't change what is important is that you get a negative margin at the base and that is very well possible using an endoscopic uh, approach uh, also so piecemeal resection doesn't change or alter the course of the local control 
the only concern is it needs a, a proper expertise in and, tra uh, and uh, training as well as the proper infrastructure to manage the uh, disease so open versus endonasal there was a large uh, national uh, cancer database study and of involving 2000 plus patients wherein they, they saw the they kind of compared the results between the two the overall virus survival rates were equivalent to both and uh, n block versus piecemeal had no significant difference in the outcomes uh, the only true predictor was a negative margin now endonasal approach is basically uh, all the lesions which are either confined to the sinuses uh, not involving the external skin not involving going or involving the palate or going beyond the mute papillary lines on either side, they are all amenable to endoscopic or endonasal approach. Now, a transcranial disease limiting up itself to the dura and not going more transdurally or involvement of the brain, transdural extension, they are still amenable to uh, endoscopic approach. You can do an endo CFR, that is uh, through the nasal cavity, you do, uh, 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 I'm sorry, you can do a, a trans uh, craniofacial resection of the entire cranial fossa and uh, the entire dural resection is also possible uh, with the margins can be taken on the dura till the level of the plenum. I mean, the posterior extension is very important how much uh, posterior extension of the disease is. So if it is going beyond the from plate, the possibility of converting into open is more. So the dural repair it becomes difficult if it is going more posteriorly beyond the uh, from area. And so uh, INOC CFR is also feasible if there is an anterior involvement of the uh, uh, dural involvement. So, uh, when when you are planning for uh, maxillectomies, these are the different types of maxillectomies, medial infrastructure, suprastructure, subtotal or total. Medial maxillectomies are possible endoscopically while other uh, these things are to be done open. Radiotherapy uh, as a definitive therapy has a very limited role, especially only for those locally advanced unfit patients uh, for surgery. Otherwise, they are primarily as an adjuvant role in advanced stage uh, tumors, high-grade tumors, uh, high-risk uh, histological, perineural or lymphovascular uh, involvement uh, presence, lymph nodes, positive lymph nodes, positive margins, or any other concerns where there is uh, a chance that the surgery adequacy is doubtful. Uh, it can be 3D CRT, IMRT, or uh, a recent version is uh, a recent addition is a proton therapy. Now, IMRT is by and large preferred for majority in view of the uh, more of uh, focused and uh, planned radiotherapy and the chances of uh, limitations, the limitations that we have in skull base are the, uh, the orbits on either side, the brain, cranium, the olfact, uh, the carotids, which can be uh, better spared with IMRT as compared to 3D CRT. Protons, uh, they benefit because they can give deliver a larger dose to a tumor site uh, and sparing the normal structures, uh, preventing uh, cost complications. But however, there are still uh, limited options uh, in terms of availability of the centers. So by and large, IMRT as of now stays a major uh, mode of radiotherapy. Systemic therapy uh, is generally as a part of multimodal therapy. Neuroadjuvant chemotherapy uh, is primarily to optimize the uh, uh, tumor biology. Basically, uh, it helps to optimize drug delivery through an intact blood tumor blood supply. So it, it, you know, it's thought like if there is entire intact vasculature, the drug will be reaching more in a concentration and that will be effective you know, to uh, sterilize the downsize the tumor. But the problems are it delays the local regional treatment. Uh, Concurrent settings are generally limited role and in adjuvant setting, it acts as a radio sensitizer, but not very promising in this thing. Now, NSCT has the, 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 uh, the concise or the, maybe the thought behind giving NSCT in anti scalpist tumor is to improve the local tumor control rate. So margin sterilization for orbit preservation. If there is a transcranial extension or transdural to, to kind of downsize or shrink the tumor, for high-grade tumors in view of its distant metastasis uh, and uh, aggressive behavior to control the tumor growth and, and also for bioselection. 
these are various uh, data or studies that have been focused on induction chemotherapy in uh, head and neck uh, in uh, in the sinonasal cancers wherein primarily it has been used for squamous cell carcinomas in some cases as adenocarcinomas olfactory neuroblastomas like caddish c or d uh, sarcomas melanoma and snec so these are the select group of histologic histology where nsat becomes uh, uh, as a initial treatment plan which helps us to uh, kind of downstage the disease and plan for definitive therapy later on at the same time helps us to bioselect the disease whether these tumors are going to be uh, responsive or having further outcomes so in order to finally take home message snes are a distinct variety of tumors wide histological variation tumor the treatment depends primarily on the histological type surgery has still the primary role but uh, in certain group of patient chemo rt like lymphomas and sarcomas giving sarcoma chemo radiation are the primary modality nsd has a role in select group of high high grade uh, malignancies radiation is adjuvant or concurrent for select group of patient and systemic therapy has a limited role hello yeah thank you sir thank you for uh, such a comprehensive presentation on this topic it was very informative for all of us and very well and very short and crisp thank you so much for this presentation sir thank you thank now you. we'll be moving towards the case presentation for case presentation uh, i'll be inviting dr deepa nair professor head and neck oncology at tata memorial hospital mumbai uh, ma'am are you there yeah i'm here ravi yeah, okay uh, Dr. Kapil Sikka, his additional professor, Department of ENT, AIMS, Delhi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. Then uh, Dr. Rahul Naga, his professor and specialist, ENT at and, and endoscopic sinus and uh, skull base surgery uh, at uh, INHS Ashwini, Mumbai. Sir, are you there? I think uh, he is not. We is not uh, online yet. Dr. Pankuri Mittal, his she is assistant professor, ENT and head and neck surgery at AIMS, Gorakhpur. Hello everyone. And then Dr. Siddharth sir again head of the Congo surgeon endoscopic and robotic surgery Zaytus Cancer Center Ahmedabad. For case presentation I'll be inviting Dr. Kiran Joshi she is she is MCH resident at Amrita Hospital Mumbai. Eh, sorry Amrita Hospital Kochi. Uh, Dr. Kiran Dr. Kiran. Yeah. You, uh, so I think we can start with the case presentation now. Uh, is my screen visible? Yeah I'm, it is visible. It is visible. Good evening all. I am presenting a case of 61 year old gentleman resident of Muscat shopkeeper by occupation presented to us with chief complaint of right nasal blockage for past 3 months history of epistaxis from right nasal cavity for past 2 weeks and history of mild bulge over right side of dorsum of nose for 2 weeks coming to present uh, history uh, according to patient patient uh, present uh, patient gives the history of right side nasal blockage uh, for past three months, uh, when uh, he presented, uh, he was apparently asymptomatic three months back when he uh, developed right side of nasal blockage, which was insidious in onset and progressive in nature. Now uh, it has uh, now there is complete obstruction. Uh, it is not relieved by medicines. No specific aggravating factor is there, and it is associated with right side of facial heaviness. Patient has also uh, patient also gives complaints of epistaxis. Three to four episodes till now. Spontaneous uh, bleeding is there, which is stops on local pressure. Uh, the amount is mild, three to four drops at a time. There is no aggravating and relieving factor for the same. Uh, so sorry to interrupt here. Uh, can I have the age again? Sixty-one year old. Uh, patient also gives history of bulge over the right side uh, dorsum of nose, which is insidious in onset. Gradually progresses to current size. Uh, do we have a clinical photograph here? Uh, unfortunately, I have lost the photos and the endoscopy. I have the MRI. So you have only MRI. So can I ask a question here? Uh, wh what is the uh, clinical relevance of age if the patient is coming at this age vis-a-vis -vis if they are coming at much younger age, maybe in childhood? Uh, so if patient is coming at advanced age, then uh, the history uh, uh, point towards the tumor malignancy. And if the patient is presenting at a uh, young age, then there could be polyps, allergic polyps. Uh, so 
So can you put your uh, symptom slide again, please? Let me make a point very clear. You have said that there is a nasal blockage. You have said there is epistaxis and you have said there is a bulge over right dorsum of nose. That's why I was very interested in uh, having a clinical photograph here. Uh, and your first differential at younger age is a nasal polyp. May I disagree with that? Sorry, sir, I couldn't hear you. You said that there is a nasal blockage, there is epistaxis and bulge over dorsum of nose. And your first differential in younger age is polyp. In, uh, infected uh, polyp could be there or angiofibroma. I would uh, suggest that you sh you can we can categorize the age according to very young. That is pediatric population, maybe less than five years, seven years of age. Then there can be teenagers, then there can be young adults, and then there can be uh, elderly population. And differential diagnosis would be slightly different in those subcategorization of ages. Any known medical history, comorbidities or something? Yes, sir. That is uh, uh, in next slide. Patient is diabetic and hypertensive. Uh, patient has also decreased smell perception. History of what is the relevance of uh, dental extraction here? You have categorically put there is no history of dental extraction. Yes, sir. Uh, at this age, patient could have a uh, uh, loose uh, tooth for uh, which dental extraction uh, for uh, for that patient could have gone to uh, dental extraction. Uh, what is the relevance in your case? So, uh, in my case, if uh, there is malignancy which is involving the floor of maxillary sinus, patient can have loose tooth. Okay. So rather it should be a a spontaneous fall of the teeth rather than an extraction. Spontaneous loss of the teeth. That should be a proper uh, history. Uh, extraction probably doesn't give you a clue that the patient is un has some malignancy underlying. And the perspective is both ways. Uh, one, the malignancies or tumors, they can lead to loosening of teeth for which uh, the patient might consult a dentist. And otherwise also, if the patient has had a dental extraction or any dental procedure, those can lead to some paranasal sinus pathologies, which can manifest uh, in a similar manner. For example, sinusitis. In fact, there are uh, some hypotheses that fungal infections are also commoner in, in patients who have had some dental fillings or dental procedures. Uh, there is uh, no loss of sensation of cheek, no history of nasal discharge, post-nasal uh, post discharge or sneezing, no history of loosening of teeth or dental infection. No history of snoring, mouth breathing, no history of fever, no history of trauma, no history of restricted mouth opening, no history of protrusion of eyes, no history of vision disturbance or diplopia, no history of ulcer over cheek or palate, there is no history of neck swelling, no history of uh, ear complaints and uh, no history of voice change. What's the relevance of restricted mouth opening here? If the tumor is uh, involving infratemporal fossa involving the pterygoid muscle, then patient can have or if the uh, if there is a pain that could also uh, patient can also have restricted mouth opening. And what about voice change, breathing difficulty? Uh, so if the uh, tumor is filling the uh, nasopharynx coena, then patient can present as rhinolalia clausa. Patient can have uh, coming to past history. Patient is a diabetic and hypertensive on regular medications. Personal history, consumes mixed type, normal bladder bowel habit, no history of tobacco or alcohol use. Family history is uh, insignificant. To summarize my history, 61 year old, uh, shopkeeper by profession, uh, diabetic and hypertensive gentleman, presented with right side of nasal obstruction, right side epistaxis on and off, with, uh, right, uh, with mild bulge on right side of dorsum, without any history of smoking and alcohol. Uh, can you go back to the occupation history? So any particular occupation which could be re relevant to the uh, present complaint? So in paranasal sinus, the occupation is very important. In 40% of cases, it is associated with sinonasal malignancy. So if there is a wood exposure, soft food, it uh, has... Uh, uh, it has relation with the squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, 70 times more uh, squamous cell carcinoma develops in soft wood exposure. Uh, adenocarcinoma uh, develops in hardwood exposure. Similarly, nickel has uh, uh, relation with the squamous cell carcinoma, chromium, leather, and uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, radium. Plus, these all are uh, related with uh, development of malignancies. 
so presently this patient doesn't have any occupational incidents neither he is a tobacco user kiran deepayo is there any association of tobacco and uh, paranasal sinus malignancies Uh, yes ma'am so uh, there is a case control uh, study published in 1987 by hens uh, in uh, his paper he uh, he says uh, he said that there is a relative risk of 3.01 with a significant hazard that mistake, is for yeah yes ma'am sorry what uh, tobacco usage was in, uh, in that study Uh, Ma'am, uh, case control study published in 1987 by Hayans, H A Y N E. No, all tobacco smoke smokers. All smokers developed some. What's the what's the association of snuff or snooze with paranasal sinus cancers? I have not read the article completely. I have read the abstract only, but yes, in a snuff because uh, the snuff particle that get impregnated into the septum and the middle turbinate, it can uh, the patient can develop. Can it be viral also? Sorry, sir. Can it be viral also? Ah, uh, viral also, yes, sir. HPV related uh, in two thousand seventeen. Uh, Bishop article uh, has published new WHO classification of tumor where HPV uh, multi-phenotypic synonasal carcinoma is associated with HPV. Not midline carcinoma has association with EBV viral. These are. Can these you tell uh, approximate uh, incidence? Maybe if we put at uh, oropharyngeal at around twenty percent. So it is in the range of five to seven percent, less than five percent. i would put it at uh, 5 to 6% right coming to general examination the patient at, uh, during the examination the patient was conscious oriented moderately built and nourished tps 80 pulse 78 per minute regular uh, blood pressure 124 by 80 mm hg in right arm respiratory rate 18 per minute regular no use of assess- accessory muscle of respiration no pallor ictus clubbing cyanosis generalized ed uh, lymphadenopathy systemic examinations are normal coming to local examination on inspection the external contour is symmetric uh, with a small bulge 1 into 1 cm noted in right side of dorsum of nose the overlying skin was normal and pinchable there was no scar sinus ulcer and fistula the root of the nose uh, uh, supra tip tip alle columella Nasal labial groove, nasal maxillary groove appears normal on inspection. On inspection, was the was the bulge in uh, predominantly cartilaginous dorsum or was it in the bony dorsum? Uh, uh sir, it was in the do- uh, bony dorsum. High up. Yes, sir, high up. Uh, it was coming till the junction of uh, bony and cartilaginous. On inspection in uh, of vestibule, there is a polypoidal mass seen in right nasal vestibule. Left vestibule was normal. Septum cartilaginous septum was deviated towards the right, uh, left side. On palpation, uh, on palpation, the inspectory findings uh, were confirmed. One into one centimeter firm bulge is noted on right side of dorsum with normal overlying skin. Vestibule polypoidal soft mass seen filling right nasal vestibule. Could probe all around the lesion. Not sensitive to touch. Septum. The cartilaginous septum was deviated towards the left side. There was no raised temperature, tenderness, and fluctuation over the swelling over the bulge. No paranasal sinus tenderness was present. So lesion was insensitive to touch. Yes. So what does that indicate? So uh, if it uh, if it is a inferior turbinate or the nasal mucosal lining, then it will be sensitive to touch. If the mass is uh, if there is a mass, then that is uh, insensitive to touch. So paranasal sinus cancers they are not sensitive to touch. Uh, let me put it uh, if it's an in- inverted papilloma from uh, from one part of nasal cavity, it's hanging in the nose. Will it be insensitive to touch? No. If it is arising from the lateral wall of the nose, then patient can have. Uh, pain, but if it is uh, freely lying in the nasal cavity, then patient the masses will have to arise from somewhere. They can't be just freely lying in the nasal cavity. Uh, that won't be called as mass. I would put. Uh, I would not agree with that point. So you have said cartilaginous septum is deviated to one side. Do you think that it was deviated because of mass, or was it a previous deviation? Uh, because 
patient has not complained of uh, nasal obstruction uh, from the early childhood uh, so maybe uh, this deviation is because of the mass so it, it may be because of uh, mass could you see the other side nose no sir i could not able to so it was severe enough that it was almost occluding the other side uh, it was uh, obstructing the other side also i could not pass my uh, endoscope go on Uh, patency test: the cold spatula test decreased fogging on the right side. Cotton wool test decreased movement on the right side was present. Oral cavity: no palatal or upper gingival buccal sulcus bulge is present. No loosening of teeth is present. Eye examination: bilateral extraocular muscle movements are full and free. Bilateral visual acuity normal. No ptosis, proptosis, or diplopia. In uh, neck, there is no palpable lymphadenopathy. radial nerve examination olfactory nerve uh, there was decreased smell perception but the rest of the cranial nerve examination were normal did you did you test the fields of vision and do you think they are relevant uh, yes uh, uh ophthal evaluation was done so they had checked the field of vision but uh, i have checked only the visual acuity and extra ocular movements if you are told to uh, give a rough estimate of field of vision are you able to perform that if if i want to know whether it's decreased or not field of vision sir i don't know how did you see the optic nerve sir optic nerve we can do the testing of the pupillary light reflex so pupillary light reflex is a test for optic nerve function uh it is only because it forms only the afferent pathway so not exactly but we can check the uh visual acuity what is rapd so rapd we can see the pupillary dilatation that is because of the pupillary reflex when there is It's a over simplified answer i would say if there is a uh, afferent pathway defect uh, of pupillary uh, reflex that uh, the pupil will be dilated so if left optic nerve is involved suppose the patient is uh, here is normal but suppose patient is uh, has early optic nerve involvement is partly blinded what will happen to rapd so uh, on that side because the efferent is normal the fifth nerve is normal so the just tell me when you shine light on right eye what will happen opposite side there will be the uh, uh, there will not be the constriction i feel your concept is uh, all right what you are telling is all right but the way you are conducting it i think you need to read it because uh, uh, briefly putting you have to put the flash of light on both eyes one by one and uh, if the uh, efferent pathway of ipsilateral side is affected then while you shine the light on other side the pupil will not stay constricted it will dilate but so that is rapd to be precise so okay. how do you check the motor and sensory trigeminal nerves so for sensory we have the light uh, touch and pain we can ask the patient to close the eye and then with the cotton wool we can uh, test the light uh, touch and so you, uh, you told the patient to close the eye close the eye then on one side we can compare with the other side for the light touch with the cotton or wool why not open eye uh, then patient can be quiet so where did you touch on closed eye so uh, for trigeminal nerve we check on the uh, cheek v1 v2 v3 uh, uh, territory area uh, over the forehead we can compare uh, uh, both the sides we can compare the cheek either side and similarly you uh, can test the trigeminal nerve with eyes open because cornea is a very sensitive uh, part with your for your cotton based test for trigeminal nerve but you need to do it properly so that patient is not biased and motor and for motor we can ask the patient to clench the teeth and uh, we can uh, feel the tightness of the masseter and temporalis simultaneously we can uh, see the jaw jerk by uh, hammering over the lower jaw and we can see the deviation of the jaw okay, coming to nasal endoscopy septum was deviated to left side could not negotiate uh, beyond the deviation and then would your cranial nerve examination be complete uh no i have not examined all the told all the equipment uh, because uh, for this case i thought rest of the cranial nerves so would not theoretically a uh, nasopharyngeal mass or a nasal mass go laterally or posteriorly to involve the jugular foramen also so always complete the entire cranial nerve examination please how do you check the ninth nerve 
For ninth now we can check the gag reflex. Shall I tell all the cranial nerve examination or proceed further? If you have done. Uh, sir, nasal endoscopy. Uh, uh, I uh, am sorry, I have lost the video. Uh, septum was deviated towards the left side. Could not negotiate it. Uh, could not negotiate beyond the deviation. Anterior nasal floor was normal. Anterior one third of inferior turbinate on left side uh, was normal. Polypoidal mass was seen in the right side of nasal vestibule. What is polypoidal and what is non-polypoidal? Uh, Sir, so polypoidal when uh, there are multiple uh, uh, multiple lobulations are there and. Uh, non polypoidal it could be a single uh, single mass we can see so this was a multi lobulated looking mass yes. so i i would uh, uh, like to have some more description on uh, what the mass looked like was it pink was it red what is pale was it gray uh, was it fluff covered so, where did it seem to arise from yes sir so there was a uh, mild uh, discharge was uh, purulent uh, not purulent there was whitish discharge present on the floor of the uh, right side of the nasal cavity which i suction uh, out and the mass was uh, not very bright red but it was uh, pink in appearance uh, you touched the mass you tried to suck that discharge uh, yes sir and did it bleed uh no sir shall i show the mri pictures this is your diagnosis so considering the age uh, can you can you summarize the things again you put a summary after your history can you uh, summarize things again sir 61 year old male shopkeeper by occupation diabetic hypertensive uh, presented with a right side of nasal obstruction epistaxis and uh, bulge on the right side of dorsum uh on examination with the uh, polypoidal mass in the right side of the nasal cavity for the duration uh, for a uh, past three months so it's a bleeding mass yes he one sided uh, in a 61 year old and uh, it's progressing rapidly more or less static uh, uh, so gradually progress no? three months has caused a bulge uh, has caused a uh, septal deviation significant enough to obstruct the other nose i would call it more or less rapid on so what comes to your mind so it could be uh, it could be sinonasal malignancy it could be uh, inverted papilloma though the history of papilloma requires uh, long history long history in the sense 5 years uh, Two three years. So you have been uh, very uh, in a catchy manner repeatedly saying is a diabetic. Can it be fungus? Fungus. The uh, patient has no other symptom except the nasal. If there is a fungus in a diabetic patient, then it could be invasive. Patient can present with orbital symptoms also. It can be fungus. There is protrusion of eye, or you said there is nothing. No orbital symptoms. And you said so, it can be polyp in a young patient. Can it be polyp here also? So, if the patient uh, was having polyp, then uh, there should be a history of uh, discharge, uh, which was not there. Patient can, uh, in polyp patients can initially present with the sinusitis kind of features, but patient didn't give such kind of history. Kiran, so would it be safe to say that at the end of your history and examination? you just have a right nasal mass which you would want to evaluate further but i think you should go with that rather than try and offer a histopathological differentiation yes uh go ahead how will you manage this case first i will uh, would like to do the imaging imaging in terms of uh, mri uh, nose and pns with contrast enhancement uh, with thick but high re resolution ct pns by doing the imaging i would able to know the vascularity of the tumor for taking the biopsy in opd basis or in uh, under ga so after getting the imaging i would like to proceed with the biopsy to uh, know the kiran to stop you here why would you want to do an mr as your first investigation why not just a ct pns because a ct will give you most uh, of this evaluation including vascularity extent of disease and like couple said if it is a fungal that itself could be picked up on a ct scan 
So if your initial differential can be done with your CT scan, so why do you want to do an MR as a first investigation? Hello. Yeah. Then go ahead with the contrast enhance a uh, CT scan of paranasal sinus. And then later on, we can get the, if required, then we can get the MRI. So what are you looking for in your MRI other than the vascularity and for biopsy? Any particular things you want to look out for in the MRI as a clinician surgeon? MRI, uh, we can uh, know the uh, soft tissue extension of the tumor. If there is a perineural invasion, orbit involvement or anterior skull base involvement, that all we can see the MRI. And to differentiate in a CT scan, we can't differentiate the secretions with the tumor. So that we can also uh, uh, can differentiate with the MRI. There are certain uh, things. I think uh, we have dual uh, uh, aim or objective here. One, we have to have a rough differential diagnosis in mind and two, we have to evaluate the extent of disease. So there are certain features that are very typical on CT scan, like focal hyperostosis in, uh, in inverted papillomas. There are characteristic dural enhancements in MRI for meningiomas, uh, orbital uh, tumors. There are certain, uh, for example, fungal sinusitis, as ma'am said, that they are more characteristic on CT scan rather than MRI scan. So what uh, we want to explore is should it be both because you have put MRI first I'll do MRI first and also couple it with CT scan so MRI is a complementary to CT scan if we are going uh, for surgery then uh, we would like to know about the skull base involvement orbit involvement uh, the extent of the lesion uh, and if there is perineural invasion like in adenoid cystic carcinoma uh, which we can misinterpret by CT scan. Uh, so it is a complementary. Okay. So you will do both? Yes, sir. In all nasal masses, you will do both? Not in all nasal masses. Uh, if you are proceeding for the surgery, yeah. In those cases, of course, we, like, we would like to do the both. If you are not doing surgery, you don't do MRI or you don't do CT. So CT scan is required, at least CT scan, uh, because we have to, for biopsy, we have to know, we should know the... Uh, biopsy is a surgery or not? Biopsy. Is also a minor surgery, you can say. You said biopsy under general anesthesia. So if it is a vascular mass, which is a bleeding... So what tells you that? So uh, there will be contrast enhancement uh, in the uh, gadolinium MRI. So by seeing that, we can see that. And in uh, CT scan, if it is enhancing, then uh, it could be vascular mass. Uh, so like hemangioma, hemangioendothelioma, hemangioparasitoma, then probably we can take precautions. We can do in uh, gen uh, general anesthesia also. But generally at your place, you do it under local. Yes. Can you name a few vascular nasal masses? You named uh, one or two, but. Uh, so, uh, AV malformation, hemangioma, hemangioparasitoma, esthesio neuroblastoma, not very uh, vascular, but yes, vascular. In adult, angiofibro, in young, but we won't proceed for the biopsy. Uh, Kiran, are there some tumors, malignancies, in which the CT will have findings which will surpass the MRI, which the CT is more necessary for diagnosis compared to an MRI? Yes, ma'am. So, if there is chondrosarcoma, where we can see the ring and arch-like uh, ossification pattern, uh, CT is diagnostic. Uh, and if it is a Mm. Osteosarcoma, uh, though it is rare in maxilla as compared to mandible. Uh, and in inverted papilloma, we can see the focal hyper, hyperostosis. Uh, so these 
malignancy uh, can you see uh, can you see malignant transformation of inverted papilloma on mri uh, so in uh, uh, in uh, ct scan uh, uh, we can uh, uh, we can see the malignant transformation in mri there will be the cerebriform pattern but uh, in uh, ct scan we can see the malignant transformation what are the causes of proptosis here uh, if you you said there is no eye protrusion if the patient has eye protrusion what are the common causes that come to your mind and what is better investigation in such cases uh, so if patient is having proptosis then it indicates that there is some retrobulbar mass paranasal sinus malignancy is coming to, through the inferior orbital fissure and pushing, pushing the eye uh, forward or there is a retrobulbar mass uh, in the um, behind the orbital apex uh, pushing the eye forward so when you said it can be a bulbar extension that is direct orbital extension it can be retrobulbar extension but don't forget one of a common factors that superadded infections or tumors can also cause cavernous sinus thrombosis and cavernous sinus involvement which in turn can lead to some degree of uh, Uh, proptosis one side or the other sorry pankuri i think i i i interrupted you so i was just saying that uh, loss of cerebriform pattern can suggest uh, transformation of inverted papilloma i am right uh, sorry ma'am i could not get you i was just saying that uh, if there is the loss of cerebriform pattern if there is loss of cerebriform pattern on mri it can also suggest malignant transformation in ct scan we focus on hyperostosis and there we can see where is the sclerosis there we can uh, see the uh, malignant transformation in mri we get the cerebriform pattern indicate uh, this is inverted papilloma so we can correlate with that thing so kiran i differ with you the hyperostosis and the sclerosis will suggest that it is a long standing tumor is when you have erosions that suggests it's malignant hypostosis is more where the uh, tumor is long standing and i agree with dr konkodi that loss of cerebrum uh, cerebriform pattern is in the areas where you have loss of cerebro uh, cerebriform pattern you suspect the scc and you should target try and target your biopsy from there okay uh, can you differentiate between the uh, like uh, dural um, inflammation and dural involvement inflammation and dural involvement involvement uh, so uh, when there is a dural involvement uh, we can see uh, the uh, nodularity and uh, uh, if it is uh, more than 5 mm uh, dural nodularity then we suspect that dura is involved if there is a uh, intraaxial intradural involvement then we can see the edema inside the parenchyma and uh, if uh, there is only in uh, extra axial intradural involvement then uh, the edema uh, brain edema won't be there parenchymal edema won't be there just the dural thickening nodular thickening more than 5 mm and in inflammation uh, on t2 it will be uh, bright hyper intense but on contrast there will be no enhancement but when there will be dural involvement uh, there will be uh, t2 hyper intense and contrast it will enhance uh, kiran can you tell like how and uh, when we will plan our imaging based on the involvement for the dural for the dural involvement what imaging will you do for a, whether a ct scan or an mri for such a case Sorry, sir. I couldn't get you. Can you repeat once again? Like, uh, yeah. What investigation? Suppose you have done a CT scan. You see a dural enhancement. Will you do an MRI to confirm uh, how much? What is the amount of dural involvement or the orbital involvement? How will you make a decision for these two in, uh, places? Ah, uh, for decision for the surgery or decision suppose for suppose you decision for the further management. Suppose you are going to give any CT. When you are going to give any CT. with the imaging so or you are going to add on an imaging when will you do a ct scan only and when will you add on an mri on these investigations uh, 
So uh, on uh, first imaging is CT scan. If on CT scan uh, there is involvement of orbit, dura, uh, then uh, we will get the MRI scan to see how much the dura is involved, how much is the orbit in, is involved uh, because uh, the further surgery will be decided by the involvement of the orbit and dura. And uh, if, uh, uh, if there is uh, just abutment of the lamina or just abutment of the dura, we can go ahead with the surgery. But if uh, there is uh, uh, periorbital involvement uh, breaching the orbita, we can give uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy. So there are three uh, meta-analysis uh, by MD Anderson group, Bossy et al, uh, Ahmed et al, and uh, Gotham et al, uh, giving the NACT uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy in SNEC, SNAP, and esthesio neuroblastoma, where they have seen the better outcome by giving the new adjuvant chemotherapy. And there uh, we have one paper from University of Virginia in esthesio neuroblastoma, where in 34 patients, over a 20 year period, they have given the pre-op CT chemotherapy. Pre-op chemotherapy in uh, Caddish C and uh, pre-op radiation in Caddish A. There they have also seen that two third of reduction of the tumor size they have noted. So NACT for uh, organ preservation, like orbit preservation, uh, when it is uh, reaching the periorbita and uh, uh, the uh, in squamous cell carcinoma, there is uh, uh, dural involvement, intradural, intraaxial involvement, then we can give NACT, though there is no RCT in this. Kiran, for the benefit of the students, do you know of any orbital grading, uh, grading of orbital involvement? There is a ENT at all uh, grading of orbit involvement in uh, grade one. In grade A, there is only uh, uh, bone breach. Uh, in uh, grade B, there is extraconal uh, orbit involvement, and in grade C, there is muscle intraconal involvement of the orbit, uh, muscles periorbital and globe. So based on that, orbital excentration is decided. If it is grade C, then we have to go ahead with the orbital excentration. In grade B, there is plus and minus uh, option of orbital excentration. So if you're not planning orbital excentration, how are you treating the orbit? If, uh, if there is a... Uh, Involvement of orbit, and I'm not planning. Uh, I couldn't get you, sir. Can you? So, if there is a minimal orbital involvement, or the tumor shrinks as a result of NACT intervention, uh, still, do you treat the orbit or do you leave it? So, if it is only the lamina uh, uh, abutting lamina is involved, then I will resect the lamina and will send the periorbit as frozen. And when it is involving the muscle, of course. Uh, uh, I would like for I would like to go with orbital excentration. Will you radiate the orbit? Uh, if we are radiating the orbit, then it is better to remove the orbit because optic nerve can't withstand more than forty five grays. And if we are giving if we are giving less than forty five grays, then anyhow the tumor in the orbit we won't be able to treat. Very controversial statement you have made, Kiran. Yeah. So then most cases where there is tumor abutting the uh, lamina papyrusia, which will require radiation, you would suggest that we should do an orbital excentration? You are saying wherever you need to radiate the orbit, yeah. uh, excentration is better. No, sir. No, sir. If it is involvement of muscle, then I would like to go with the orbital excentration. If it is abutting the lamina papyracia, then we can go ahead with the surgery, sending the periorbita as frozen. There is no need of excentration of the orbit. If it is unresectable tumor, then we can uh, send the patient for radiation. Huh? We will give for a patient who has a ethmoidal cancer, which you have resected, uh, resected the lamina papyracia, removed the periorbital, sampled the periorbital fat and said that that orbital fat is negative. So preserve the globe. Is there, uh, it does, does the radiation portals change for this patient? Uh, 
so if the peri orbiter is negative uh, then uh, we can limit our radiation uh, to the medial wall only there is no need to radiate the whole orbit so the radiation oncologist will always go by the pre treatment uh, do, uh, extent of disease so the orbital fat would receive amount of radiation they will try and tailor the dose at the optic chiasm but the disease uh, in the lateral orbit will be tailored and obviously they are going to give imrt in this so the dose uh, dose painting will be done to involve all pre surgery tumor extensions but they'll try and limit the dose at the optic chiasm okay Uh, can you proceed with your case? Yes, ma'am. I will uh, share the MRI scans. Yes, please. Stop sharing. Uh, give me a moment. I am sharing. So, uh, these are the axial. Uh, 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 man, uh, my screen is visible. Uh, scans are visible. Yes, scans are visible. So this is an axial contrast uh, uh, contrast enhances scan of the uh, parent is uh, hidden neck region uh, coming from superior to inferior. We can see the superior sagittal sinus and uh, starting of the front uh, no, frontal bone. Uh, these are the lateral ventricle. We can see. Going downward, we can see uh, some cystic collection, some cyst, uh, loculate, uh, some uh, multi-loculated cyst sits in both uh, side of the frontal sinus, lateral uh, ventricle, and uh, now we can see the appearance of the orbit. Uh, this is the frontoethmoidal recess coming on the left side. Uh, this uh, non-enhancing multi-loculated uh, cyst uh, just abetting the nasal bone anteriorly, extending towards the ethmoid sinus, abetting the lamina on the right side. How do you know it's non-enhancing uh, and it's not uh, a central necrosis? Uh, because sir, uh, uh, this is the contrast enhanced scan and uh, I can see the uh, low intensity uh, in the center and the periphery is uh, uh, comparatively bright. As such, uh, it is not enhancing, the whole structure is not enhancing. So in the center, there could be necrosis, there could be fluid, which I will confirm on T2. So uh, this uh, multi-loculated uh, cystic lesion is involving the whole ethmoid gallery. Abetting uh, the right side of the lamina, or and left side lamina also anteriorly nasal uh, nasal bone. Uh, extending posteriorly, these are the uh, optic nerves. We can see the optic chiasm, which is away. It is uh, abetting the lamina papyracea in the whole. Uh, extent and causing contour bulging on either side. Uh, we can see that- it Can you is, comment on medial rectus muscle? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, it is abutting the lamina and the muscle, uh, there is contour uh, bulging. Can you see the lamina here? Sir, lamina actually, this is MRI, so I can't appreciate much, but it is because causing the contour bulging of the medial rectus on either side. So I can say there is abutment of the lamina on either side. Might be erosion also? Uh, could be erosion. Uh, uh, for that, I would like to uh, bony erosion. I can see on CT scan uh, uh, involvement of orbit. I would like to confirm on T one. Uh, 
images. These are T1 images. These are contrast enhanced images. So, uh, what what is uh, what is your conclusion? Is the orbit involved or it's not involved? I can't comment on this because uh, fat is suppressed, so I can't see the fat here, sir. So the uh, periorbital fat is uh, black. Okay. So this is the fat suppressed image, so I can't comment on whether the orbit is invaded or not. But uh, definitely it is abutting the lamina papyracea on either side. That's why it is causing the contour bulging of the medial rectus muscle on either side. But it is not pressing the optic chiasm. Optic chiasm is free. Uh, ju just give a moment, sir. It is not going actually down. So, uh, so, sorry for the interruption. So, uh, it is. Uh, these are the uh, these are uh, this is the orbit on either side. Uh, this is the sphenoid sinus, sphenoethmoidal recess. Uh, this is the septum. We can see the black line uh, causing uh, left side of the DNS. Uh, now we can see the appearance of the maxillary sinus. On the left side, uh, uh, here on the uh, right side, uh, there is uh, in uh, medial wall is uh, it is abutting uh, the medial wall of the uh, right side of the maxilla, and uh, in left side also, and then it is uh, involving the posterior wall of the right side of the maxilla, and this uh, one cystic uh, bulge is. Uh, they are in the maxilla, which is from the posterior wall. It is involving the pterygopalatine fossa here. Uh, these and uh, in the sphenoid, we can see the extension of this tumor also. Can you show us the carotids and uh, if the dura is involved or not? Okay. So this is the uh, this is the clival carotid on either side. which is becoming the uh, petrous carotid, the horizontal one. And this is the lacerum carotid on either side. And uh, here uh, the carotid, uh, carotid is on the uh, nasopharynx. So the carotids are well away from the lesion. So uh, the... Uh, so the lesion is involving uh, the uh, whole of the nasal cavity, uh, which is uh, not enhancing multi-loculated, uh, uh, involving bilateral of bilateral nasal cavity, maxilla on the right side, involving the medial wall of the maxilla, posterior wall of the maxilla, infratemporal fossa, pterygopalatine fossa on the right side. And going downward, it is... Uh, uh, it is occupying the nasopharynx also. This large cystic space. Do we have CT images also? Uh, sir, I have the T1. Uh, CT images are not there. T1 images I have. T2 images I have. So coming uh, from top to bottom, uh, T2 weighted uh, axial images, we can see the T2 bright uh, uh, multi-loculated -loc uh, cyst on frontal uh, occupying the bilateral frontal sinuses. And uh, this uh, mass is uh, well encapsulated uh, 
causing uh, abutting the lamina on either side. It is uh, abutting the medial wall of the orbit on either side, causing uh, uh, deviation of septum towards the left side, multiloculated uh, T2 uh, bright mass with involvement of medial wall of maxilla, posterior wall of the maxilla. And uh, on the right side of the infratemporal fossa, abetting the lateral uh, pterygoid muscle on the right side. On left side, it is uh, abutting the medial wall of the maxilla causing uh, contour bulging. And uh, there is a large uh, uh, mass in, uh, occupying the nasopharynx. The oropharynx and oral cavity rest is normal. Do you have a sagittal sequence? Uh, yes, ma'am. So these are the sagittal images going from left to right. This is uh, this is the uh, cystic mass which is occupying the maxillary, uh, maybe abutting or occupying. We can't say here, uh, but uh, there is no breach of inferior orbital fissure and pushing the orbit up, uh, filling the nasal cavity. Abutting the skull base, anterior skull base, uh, causing the contour bulging, pushing the bone up. The clivus looks uh, normal. There is a large cystic uh, 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 loculation in the nasopharynx. The it is invading the uh, bone. It is kind of extensile kind of mass which is bulging into the anterior skull base. What's your radiological diagnosis? So as uh, we can see that uh, it is uh, T2 bright and uh, non-contrast enhancement is there uh, and causing uh, the contour bulging, not eroding. So uh, my differential goes towards the uh, uh, either the uh, uh, slow growing uh, either the benign uh, sinonasal tumor or slow growing uh, malignant, low grade slow growing malignant tumor. What's the biopsy? Biopsy is... Biopsy is poorly differentiated carcinoma. That's quite an unusual looking uh, to be a poorly differentiated carcinoma. Yes, ma'am. Biopsy is differentiated carcinoma. Differentials they have given poorly differentiated is commercial carcinoma or nut midline carcinoma. Uh, okay. To me, anyways, I'm not a radiologist, but I, my first thing on looking at the scans was is it an amyloblast uh, with a typical soap bubble appearance? Or an aneurysmal bone cyst. I could uh, yeah. feel that there was a, a, so that is definitely yeah. one differential where you can. Yeah, so ABC. Uh, Sorry, I meant a ABC, not a amyloblastoma. ABC is what I wanted right. to say. So it looked very typically like this. Uh, what IHS they have done? I, will you, I think you had a slide on uh, histology report. Uh, I will share just in a moment. Is my screen visible, sir? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, ISC, they have uh, written as focal positive for cytokeratin, AMA, P40, P63, CD34 positive. Uh, S100 and synaptophysin positivity in occasional cells, negative for CD56, chromogranin, HMB45, SMA, CK5 or 6.
So okay. what? Is my slide visible? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, before this biopsy report, you said that on radiological, you feel it could be a benign or a low-grade malignancy. Yes. Now, on the radiology, you saw that there is a kind of an infiltration of the ITF as well. Uh, yes. So, why do you thought or what could be uh, your probable diagnosis with all these findings with an ITF involvement? I mean, my, I've been just trying to ask you. What was your thought process of considering this as a benign? So, uh, because it is not uh, uh, there is a contour bulging of the bones. Uh, so, uh, it, it is a big mass which is involving bilateral nasal cavity. It is abutting whole uh, lamina and only uh, the contour bulging is there, expensile kind of thing. There is, uh, in cases of uh, High grade malignancy, uh, we can see the erosion directly, not uh, like the contour bulging as here I'm seeing. So I thought uh, it could be uh, benign or slow, uh, low grade malignancy as first of my duty. Okay. So when, when the biopsy was taken, was it very kind of vascular lesion? It, it, it was bleeding, but uh, it was not like that. Um, uh, it is not uncontrollable bleeding. Yes, but it was vascular mass. Okay, so, so what do you do next? So uh, if it is uh, poorly differentiated uh, squamous cell carcinoma or not midline carcinoma, I would like to counsel the patient regarding if uh, particularly if it is not midline carcinoma, I would uh, like to uh, counsel the patient regarding the prognosis and the aggressiveness of the disease. And uh, is it better or worse than esthesia neuroblastoma? It is worse. Uh, in all the series, on all the retrospective series, is the maximum survival. I was waiting for you to comment, but you never did, neither in your clinical evaluation nor here about the neck nodes. Uh, was there any nodal disease? No, sir, I have put there was no lymphadenopathy. In your MRI also, there was nothing? Uh, no, sir. And what levels did you see? That specifically, I saw oh, level 1B and level 2. Not retrocaringia? Retropharyngeal, I could not appreciate actually. On uh, radiology? Yeah, it is important to look for retropharyngeal lymph node, specifically when the mass is the part of the nasal cavity extending to the nasopharynx involving the wall of the maxilla. Yes, we have to look for retropharyngeal. And uh, what is the relevance of PET scan? So, uh, PET scan uh, to see uh, for the distant metastasis as if it is an aggressive malignancy in cases of nut midline carcinoma, uh, the patient can present with the distant metastasis. How do we treat him now? So, uh, we have to use the multimodality treatment, a surgery followed by uh, chemoradiotherapy, though we don't have the con concrete data on that. But in all the series, they have used the all uh, modalities of treatment uh, in treating uh, nut midline carcinoma. Kevin, there's, yes. yes, please. Sorry. Kiran, there's the involvement of the infratemporal fossa and that widening of the pterygopaltine fossa, if I'm not mistaken, on the right side, you'll still operate this patient? Because there is no perineural invasion uh, and the best cure we can give with this, uh, with the surgery. So, we can go ahead. With the what are the margins you expect with this surgery? Uh, so, I am not thinking uh, the, uh, uh, I'm not thinking to get the uh, very good margin, but uh, because it is kind of expensive, uh, we can do the total maxillectomy and there is no perineural invasion, we can do the uh, pterygopalatine fossa clearance along with infratemporal fossa clearance.
and uh, uh, later on we can subject the patient to i am not wrong tumor was just abutting the medial maxillary wall on one side it it's not a pure maxillary tumor so on the uh, on the left side we can go ahead with the we can do the medial maxillectomy but on the right side because it is involving the medial and posterior wall so we have to do the total maxillectomy or we can because patient age is 61 year old and this nut midline carcinoma is a very aggressive we can give the option of uh, radical ctrt to the patient any role of neoadjuvant induction chemo therapy in 61 year old uh, patient uh, having nut midline carcinoma there are not much uh, reports on that but in poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma patient has given uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy in young patient you say any other molecular marker you would want to do in this patient to tailor your treatment uh, yes in nut midline carcinoma for that we can do the translocation study nut brac uh, where we can see 15q uh, 19 if it shows positive definitely like carcinoma we can uh, give the option to ct the patient considering no some other thing so the nut carcinoma can be only confirmed only if you have the nut uh, ihc or a translocation study positive i am asking with respect to planning therapy for the patient would you want to do any other molecular markers for these patients With this is positive, ma'am. Yeah. I'm not sure. Is there any role of PDL one? PD, yes, ma'am. We can not uh, uh, for immunotherapy. Recently, uh, uh, that was there. Uh, that article is there uh, for PEMDO in maxillary sinus carcinoma. Okay. uh so leave leave aside nut and let's go back to the most common carcinoma if this was a squamous cell carcinoma would you still go ahead with total maxillectomy itf clearance and then ctrt for the patient because squamous cell carcinoma has uh, uh, perineural invasion tendency so if it is high tergopalatine fossa involvement then we can go ahead with the radical ctrt how would you manage the neck when uh, you are planning this patient this patient has no nodes would you still address the neck so uh, there is controversy regarding the neck management so uh, some there are two schools of thought uh, some says if it is t3 t4 and high grade uh, we can do the selective neck dissection cases of n0 and uh, the other school of thought says ki uh, uh, says uh, because it is t3 t4 you are uh, t3 t4 you are subject to radiation after the surgery with the uh, adjuvant radiation so the neck will be irradiated at the uh, that so there is would you would you address, if you are surgically treating the neck would you address the nodes of ruvier uh, nodes of ruvier we can uh, address with the adjuvant radiation Okay. What if this patient had an adenocarcinoma? How would your management change for this patient? So for adenocarcinoma, there is a paper by Lisa Lesetra and Bossi et al. in 2013, I guess, uh, where they have used PFL regime, uh, cisplatin five fluorouracil and leucovarin in cases of P53 wild type. so in intestinal type of adenocarcinoma they have checked the isc p53 if it is wild kind of p53 uh, then they have given this pfl regime and they have seen the overall survival advantage uh, uh, i am sorry to interrupt uh, kiran whenever you start answering something please do not start answering by the evidence First, tell the concept that you are telling in. If required, then you please give the evidence. Okay, sir. Sorry. Sir. I believe that is uh, okay, Deepa, ma'am. I agree with you, Asim. First, you tell your plan, and then you can back it up with evidence. Yeah, please continue, please. 
So in adenocarcinoma, first we have to check whether it is intestinal or non-intestinal. So if it is intestinal type of adenocarcinoma, then th uh, there is a role of uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy when it is abutting lamina uh, or involving uh, or involving ITF. We can go ahead with the uh, or involving the dura. Then we can go ahead with the NACT. Uh, P with PFL regime, cisplatin, 5-fluorouracil, leucovirin, and uh, then uh, after NACT, we can do the surgery. So we are getting well past... Uh, yeah, yes, sorry. Or non it is uh, Sorry, ma'am. Hello? Am I audible? Patients for adenocarcinoma. Sorry, uh, ma'am. Could you um, tell again? I can get you. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. You are audible. I think we have lost Deepa, ma'am. Just wait a minute. We'll wait for a moment. So if we plan to operate this case, can it be pure uh, uh, If If Dr. Deepa has joined back. If not, then can you... Go ahead, Kapil. I have some... Yes. Can it be pure endoscopic? Sir, because it is involving intratemporal fossa, involving pterygopalatine fossa, medial wall late, uh, and posterolateral wall, so better to do the total maxillectomy, then we can get... Uh, so total maxillectomy, uh, you are putting is an indication for accessing intratemporal fossa? Uh, Sir, so because it is involving uh, not as an indication, but yes, uh, for a good clearance of infratemporal fossa, uh, and uh, as it is involving the two uh, walls of the maxilla, uh, I will, uh, I might prefer uh, total maxillectomy, open total maxillectomy instead of. So you remove the palate and alveolus, which is uh, seemingly uninvolved. Keeping the palate intact uh, and removing the infratemporal fossa, um, I won't get my margin because it is involving the posterior. What wall. margin are you looking at? So I am looking for the uh, palatine, uh, greater palatine uh, 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 margin. I'm not sure for that. Uh, so I may not proceed with the endoscopic for that reason. So you are saying one side total maxillectomy, other side medial maxillectomy, both side infratemporal clearance? Oh, not both sides, sir. Only the right side infratemporal fossa. The right side ITF clearance. Yes. And uh, how, how do you plan to reconstruct the defect? Uh, so uh, because uh, the uh, orbital plate will go, so uh, I would like to reconstruct with free fibula plaque. Do you expect a dural defect? Uh, yes, sir. It, it, uh, there could be a dural defect. Why do you think there will be dural defect? Uh, because, sir, it is abutting the anterior skull base. So, I would like to remove the bony uh, bones and I would like to check my margin on the dura. I'm, uh, I'm not sure uh, what will be my frozen report. I would like to send the frozen from the superior part of the nasal cavity from the dura. Uh, will your management change if you encounter a CSF leak? So, uh, if I uh, found uh, intraop CSF leak, I would like to give a uh, good uh, uh, repair on the interior skull base. Uh, maybe I would like uh, prefer a soft tissue flap or uh, yes, soft tissue flap. And? Uh, with a reconstruction of dura with the peripheral. Pericranium. So you'll stick with your free fibula and you'll put a pericranium for dura. Uh, uh, sir, or, sir, if uh, orbital floor has gone, then uh, for uh, good cosmesis, I would like to uh, put free fibula if the patient is young. 
uh, for good cause. Internet issues I'm traveling. So old patients don't deserve cosmesis. Is cosmesis the only indication to uh, put in uh, fibula for the patient? Morbidity also if the patient is high risk for long G. What is your aim of orbital flow reconstruction? So to prevent the sunking of the uh, orbit, to give the rigid support to the floor of the orbit. How will you achieve that? And what are your endpoints in achieving optimal orbital flow reconstruction? Uh, you are doing a bit of reconstructive surgery now in Amrita, aren't you? So as a surgeon, what are the uh, precautions you will take during surgery to achieve optimal orbital flow reconstruction? So, uh... Uh, if possible, I would uh, like to keep my periorbita intact. If it is not possible, then I would like to reconstruct the floor of the orbit uh, uh, by bow. Or uh, uh, if patient is not fit for uh, free fibula by saying having the comorbidity, uh, then we can go and patient requires bulk, a uh, muscle bulk, then I would uh, uh, do the plating for the inferior orbital floor and uh, we'll put soft tissue flap. Where will you anchor the plates if you are doing plating? So the plates we can anchor on the lateral uh, lateral wall of the orbit and on media, uh, laterally and uh, media, uh, lateral wall of orbit and jayagoma laterally and medially on the nasal bone. So basically you want to reconstruct the orbit so that the patient has uh, adequate support of the orbit so that the patient does not develop in ophthalmos or change in the level of the orbit to prevent a diplopia of the patients. Okay. So if you are going to resect the periorbita, the first thing is to sort of give a uh, orbital sling and then have an adequate rigid reconstruction so that your level of the orbit, orbit is maintained on both sides so that there's no in ophthalmos as well as no shift in the axis of the orbit globe. Okay, so when you are talking about orbital re goals of orbital reconstruction, you have to think about all of these points. It's not just about I'll do a fibula or I will do a rigid plate. Always think about what is your goal of reconstruction. Okay, Asim, do we have any more time or you want us to wrap up now? Um, I think uh, we can wrap up in next one or two minutes. I would ask you to give the end comments and Dr. Kapil to give the end comments. Uh, let Kapil start, please. I know Kiran very closely, so I think we should ask for Kapil's evaluation. I've also started knowing her. It was a good uh, uh, case selection, I would say. Uh, uh, you you presented it well. There were some uh, lacunae in your, uh, in your history and clinical examination which are uh, acceptable, but I feel that uh, you should improve on that. I would have liked to have a CT and a photography if you are if you are presenting to an audience which which are uh, foreign to your institute. I would have liked to see the clinical photographs, the pictures, and also radiology that was lacking. Your uh, knowledge of uh, subject was good. Uh, I and your concepts were uh, well developed. You had uh, uh, basic. Uh, skills to present that and uh, your knowledge was good. So I would uh, suggest you keep it up. So I think Kiran did a, a good job. Uh, like I echo exactly what Kapil says and it's not surprising because Kap uh, Kiran has worked with us as a skull based fellow. She has worked exclusively in these tumors for a year. Uh, but well done Kiran. Uh, like Kapil said, just keep working on your presentation slightly more and make it more uh, concise so that uh, you can directly reach the management avoiding too much delay at the uh, present uh, clin history and uh, examination findings. But well done overall. All the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I just call Ravi for the final end note and uh, thanksgiving. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Asim. I would like to thank all the faculties, especially Deepa ma'am, Kapil sir, uh, Dr. Rahul Naga, Pankuri ma'am, and uh, Dr. Siddharth Shah sir, for uh, 
taking their time out for this case discussion today. And very special thanks to Professor Kiran Joshi for such a nice and great presentation. It was really very, uh, very, very academic presentation for all of us. It really benefited us a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Kiran. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.